Hello everyone and welcome to the session about civil engineering in the 21st century. My name is Anna Itor and I'm a lecturer in the School of Civil Engineering. So what, can a, so what does the civil engineer do in the 21st century? Um, here you can see a word cloud of the main topics that dominated the media in the last few years. And I've highlighted a few words that I'll be illustrating how civil engineering can get involved. For instance, the use of technology and scientific advances to tackling climate change and implementation of environmental friendly practices in the design and construction of infrastructure towards a low carbon future. And here they are. Once you graduate from a civil engineering degree, you can be part of a team that either focuses on the design, construction or maintenance activities of a variety of infrastructure that spreads across different sectors. For instance, infrastructure that is critical to sustain the activities of our society, such energy and power needs, keep commuters and goods moving around the country and overseas, what is supply and sewage, in those, Structural engineering, which is the field responsible for the design of structures, play an important role. Similarly, geotechnical engineering is equally important as it assesses how soil and rock can be used as construction materials and is critical for understanding the way structure interacts with the ground, for instance, in foundations and tunnels. Another field that is very important is the performance assessment of construction materials and the development of novel materials to tackle net zero carbon challenges. I'll be talking a little bit more in detail of some of those related to the use of renewable energy, adoption of different approaches and materials uh, to minimize carbon footprint and the interaction of some infrastructure with the natural environment. The first type of infrastructure that I would like to show you is the offshore wind infrastructure. UK has been pioneering this type of infrastructure for the last two decades. And there are a number of different wind farms currently operating across the UK coast. I show here an illustration of the Dungeon Offshore Wind Farm. It is estimated that the annual production is 1.7 terawatts, which corresponds to electricity demands over 400,000 homes. In this type of infrastructure, both the structural and foundation design are required to make sure the structure can withstand the wind and the wave forces but also ensure that the foundation, in this case, the seabed, can carry the loads applied, such as the weight of the windmill and the force caused by the waves and the wind. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our local expert uh, in the design of these structures, Dr. Nikolaou Nikitas. Another type of infrastructure that is becoming more widely used is the solar farms for harvesting sunlight to create energy for production of electricity. The land used for a solar farm creates a safe place where nature and wildlife can flourish. I show a photo here of the Short Week Solar Park. It's one of the largest in the UK and it has a capacity for producing 72 uh, megawatts each year and contributes to reducing about over 200,000 tons of CO2 emissions and powering over 100,000 homes. Similarly to the wind farms, the structural and foundation design are critical to ensure the structure can withstand the wind forces and foundation can carry the loads of the solar panels. An important type of infrastructure that is probably not so well known are the energy structures. How do these structures work? Basically, the idea is to harvest the temperature of the ground to heat or cool our buildings. There are three main types of these type of structures, energy piles, walls and tunnels. While in the UK, the use of energy piles is perhaps the most common, the use of energy walls and tunnels has been increasingly steadily in the last decade. In this slide, I show an example of an energy pile to illustrate how the system works. These systems typically incorporate a ground source heat pump then can use, uh, that can be used to harvest the temperature in the ground. The ground temperature stays approximately the same throughout the year, but the temperature uh, in the air um, as a consequence of the season changing, 
uh, varies throughout the year. For instance, in the winter, the low, temperatures, the low temperature air is injected into the system and comes to an equilibrium with the ground temperature. In this case, it's heated. The warm air is then harvested to heat the buildings, whereas in the summer, it's the other way around. Warm air is injected and cooler air is harvested, as you can see here in the animation. This slide shows some statistics in relation to the adoption of this technology throughout the years and the associated carbon dioxide savings. As you can see, since its introduction in the late 90s, the use has been increasing and resulted in a substantial uh, uh, CO2 saving. For instance, in 2017, it was up to 25,000 tons per year of carbon dioxide savings. I would also like to take this opportunity and introduce you to our local experts, Professor Simon Rees and Dr. Fleur Loveridge. I'll continue with a slightly different topic, which is looking at the opportunities for making our buildings net carbon zero. This can be achieved by introducing innovations in construction materials, for instance, the use of wood and low carbon concrete and cement, such as geopolymer concrete and alkali activated cements. In addition, in buildings, the adoption of green walls that can sequester carbon and produce oxygen in urban environment has been increasing in the last decades. In the design of these walls, the structural design of the green skin that accommodates living plants is critical. This is also when we need to work with architectural engineers and architects to ensure that the structure can withstand the loads applied, but are also aesthetically pleasing. I show in the slides three examples, the bioenergy plant in Leeds, the Athenam Hotel in, uh, and the Cityscape House in London. The Cityscape has not been constructed yet, but once it's built, we'll have the largest living wall in Europe. Cityscape will be wrapping a facade with approximately 400,000 plants and it's estimated that annually over eight tons of carbon dioxide will be captured and six tons of oxygen produced. During your degree in Leeds, you may also have an opportunity to design stru structures. In this slide, you can see a few examples of designs of multi-story buildings integrating the use of vertical green walls that were prepared by students as the requirement of their integrated design project. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our local experts that are working towards developing low carbon cements. Professor Susan Bernal, Dr. Alastair Marsh, and Dr. Juan Pablo Jouvaudin. Let's hear from them. Concrete is the lifeline of our society is the most widely used material on the planet and contributes around 8% of the global CO2 emissions because we need very high temperatures to produce this material, but also we convert some minerals that release CO2 during the process of manufacturing. My research centers on different aspects of improving sustainability of concrete. One of the projects I have is in developing alternative green cement called alkali activated materials using the industrial byproducts from different industries. So these materials can be produced at room temperatures, which is one of the main advantages. The area within that I'm particularly looking at is the use of clays. We have to really understand what is going on at the mineralogical level to learn how we can actually use them to make cements. It's typically made using what we call a two-part process. So we have you know, the solid clays and we have a alkaline activator and we need that to dissolve the clay minerals to get them to react. We're thinking about durability because these are low CO2 materials that we want to improve how long they last in the field. And one of the biggest durability challenges that we have today is actually the corrosion of steel reinforcement. So we actually use accelerated testing and that way we can actually degrade or age the material at a faster rate than the real world. The insight that we learn from that can be extrapolated to real-time scales. We have 
some of the best facilities in the country to perform research in cement and concrete materials. We have from nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers to different environmental chambers that can simulate from marine conditions to extreme heat conditions. So it was really interesting to kind of bring all these resources together and think about the innovation that we can bring forth with it. As a construction material scientist, you really want to make the biggest impacts and improve the world as much as you can. We try to find new manufacturing routes for these materials. Use less manufactured cement and therefore improve the environmental impact. So that also make this new friendly cement very versatile and potentially available all over the globe. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the exciting developments in the manufacture of cement. Now, I'll continue with a slightly different topic, looking at opportunities for using low carbon alternatives for stabilizing soil in transport infrastructure. This is actually what I do for my research. One of the most common types of low carbon stabilization is the use of vegetation, trees and plants to reinforce the slopes and foundation of rails and road substructure. Here, I show a few examples of how plant roots can be used for the reinforcement and some photos of applications to stabilize the slopes of the road and of a rail track. Another low carbon stabilization is the use of microbes to produce binders that strengthen the soil in order that it can sustain the traffic load supply. And this would be vehicles, trucks, trains, and this type of technology would be as an alternative to high carbon binders, such as lime and conventional cement. Unfortunately, the technology is still very new and applications in practice have been very limited, but there is a tremendous potential. Staying with the transport team, in this slide, I show the statistics from a study on greenhouse emissions that showed that CO2 emissions for different modes of transport for commuter use. As you can see, the modes of transport that have the smallest emission levels are domestic rail, coach and Eurostar. You may be wondering why Eurostar being a rail line has such a substantial difference to domestic rail. This is perhaps associated with network electrification and operational infrastructure challenges of an aging UK rail network. To deal with these challenges, there is a need to incorporate innovation in the design of rail infrastructure for enhanced efficiency and resilience against climate change. Let's hear for, from a local expert in the design of rail infrastructure, Professor Peter Woodward. The Institute for High Speed Rail and Systems Integration is a collaboration to develop a research and development institute able to solve some of those long challenging issues that you see on railway track, but also place the UK as a global leader in rail. This is a real period of change on the railway. Right across the country, we're upgrading track, we're upgrading signaling to really accelerate journeys for our passengers. At the same time, we're introducing new trains onto the network. In order to test new trains on the existing network, we have to run them for hundreds of miles so we get to a point where it's performing reliably and fault-free so that we can have the confidence to bring it into service for passengers. What that means, though, is at the same time as running our everyday passenger and freight services, we have to try and squeeze a path or find a slot for these test trains to run. And that can lead to congestion and can potentially lead to disruption. So these challenges can be resolved by undertaking much of this testing off-site. When we created the Institute, we decided on two fundamental principles. The first one was to look at the whole systems integration. That's how everything connects together. The second one was to build the best testing facilities. To do that, we are constructing three innovative facilities. The first one, an infrastructure test facility. We're also developing a vehicle test facility, which is based on a rolling road type of technology. The third test facility is the Systems Integration Innovation Center. And that is all about the signaling and the command and control and about how that all interacts together to give you this whole systems integration approach. So at the end of the process, you have a vehicle where the vast majority of the issues that you are likely to encounter on track have been de-risked. Welcome back. 
The last example I would like to show you is the use of wildlife crossings to minimize the impact of built infrastructure in the natural environment. For these structures, structural and foundation design considerations are critical to ensure that they can accommodate the loads of lights and blend in with the natural environment. I show you here a few examples of crossings constructed around the world. Traffic authorities in general report that these types of structures built across roads and railways uh, to allow wildlife movement can stop species from becoming isolated and reduce the number of traffic accidents. In the UK, currently has a small number of green bridges. One of the most celebrated spans across the A21 at Scotney Castle in Kent. Completed in 2005, it not only enabled the historic drive to the castle to be preserved, but also reduced the impact on local landscape and was soon being used by door mice. Here is another example of a wildlife crossing. This crossing was part of a 550 million new Queen Elizabeth Hospital project in Birmingham. The budget crossing was required because the new access road built across the existing woodland would cut across a known budget run. I show here a few photos of the crossing that was constructed in the vicinity of the hospital. This example was kindly provided by, by a colleague in the School of Civil Engineering, David Richardson, that actually worked on this project and teaches in the Civil Engineering program. As a summary, there are three key points that govern civil engineering in the 21st century. The infrastructure must be safe. This means that it needs to we need to design infrastructure that can withstand its own weight, weight of the user. An example of this would be, say, for instance, in transport, the traffic, and the actions, winds, waves, earthquakes, and consider also the impact of climate change to make sure the, the structures are resilient. The second key point is around incorporating sustainability in our practice so that we can help society achieve the net zero carbon future and minimize impact to, to the natural environment. This can be achieved by considering renewable infrastructure, alternative low carbon construction materials, green walls, and a better integration with the natural environment as we've seen with the wildlife crossings. The last key point we need to work is to ensure that those solutions are cost effective compared to current practice. Lastly, I would like to conclude the lecture by showing you a photo of our building here at the university campus. We will look forward to welcoming you all in Leeds in the near future.